Hello and welcome to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditz, and today we continue our Fantasy File Series with a look at Saquon Barkley. So, if you drafted Saquon last year, I did in my favorite, you know, league with my college friends, you were disappointed awfully quickly because week one, he basically got completely stuck by a Steelers defense that just made a living three yards deep in the Giants' backfield, and in week two, only had four touches before unfortunately tearing his ACL. Did not get to see the same guy that, in my opinion, opinion was the single best running back in the NFL during the 2018-2019 season. So look, I would just say this at first. I think Saquon almost gets penalized for being the number two overall pick and having this sort of contract that goes along with it. Running backs don't matter. We say this because of the salary cap. Of course they matter. Look at high school. We are one of, if your best player isn't playing quarterback, they're playing running back because the position touches the ball more than anybody else. If running backs didn't matter, why would Alabama, why would Ohio State and every school be trying to recruit the best running backs from high school? They matter until we get to the NFL and the NFL says, hey, here's our arbitrary salary cap system that every team needs to get under. Now, with that in mind, once you start competing, Comparing it to every other position on the team, yes, I see why you would put less money into running backs. They're more dependent on their teammates, and we just have a longer historical track record of undrafted, you know, later round running backs thriving more so compared to your undrafted offensive linemen, your undrafted quarterbacks. I mean, hell, Mike and Kyle Shanahan have made a career behind the idea that running backs don't matter, but it's all inside the salary cap system. I mean, personally, why the hell can't Saquon Barkley make $50 million a year if somebody wants to pay him that? I mean, it's just not even an option right now. And, you know, kudos to the owners. The rich are staying richer. And I know the players are making plenty on their own as well. But I just really think that, you know, Saquon, some of these just truly incredible talents at the running back uh, position. I just wish that, you know, we could kind of remove the money side out of the equation because they're getting penalized basically because of the salary cap. That's why I got people get mad. That's why people hate on Ezekiel Elliott so much. If we took away the salary cap and just let players make as much as they could make, I mean, I don't know. Like, as a fantasy football writer, I'd be pretty pissed off if someone just said, hey, Ian, you know, you're great, but got to stay under this imaginary limit. You know, we can't pay you any more money, even though uh, your skills might be worth it. I don't think it makes much sense in another line of work, and we can argue here all day about parody and all that. Point of the matter, moral of the story, if you will, is that Saquon Barkley has been anyone's idea of one of the best players at his position, and we shouldn't let, again, just the salary cap's basic principle that you don't need to pay the running backs as much as other ones. Don't let that distract you from the fact that Saquon is one of the league's best running backs, even though we've now been taught to basically ignore his position at the professional level. So with all that said, let's get into what has made Saquon that freaking dude since he came into the NFL. And like we saw it from day one. I mean, I saw him terrorize my Buckeyes enough times in college football to know that this, you know, Saquon is just one of the more freakier talents we've seen. I mean, that USC Rose Bowl from back in the day, It's rare to see someone like Saquon with those freaking quads with the ability to truck stick your ass, whoever you are, and then put his foot in the ground, just outrun everybody. I mean, once he, you know, once he sees a sliver of space, like he is gone. He had that long, like 50 yard touchdown. It was longer than that, I think. 70 yards against the Eagles, he put his freaking finger up at the 50-yard line, like, to have that sort of confidence, and it's, you know, it's warranted, because things he's been doing, jumping, juking, spinning past guys really throughout his entire career, uh, it's tough to really find someone that has just been better with the ball in their hands, so he was the overall fantasy RB1 in 2018, led the league in broken tackles, and okay, his encore wasn't quite as good, because it's hard to go for over 2,000 yards from scrimmage in back-to-back years, but I think what people kind of forget is in that second season, I mean, he suffered a high ankle sprain that was given a four to eight week time frame for recovery early on in the season he only missed three games like this guy is a superhuman the freakiest freakiest of freak athletes I mean I know every player in the NFL has gaudy athleticism compared to you know you and me out there but even among NFL players Saquon has stood out as being a freak among freaks and kudos to him for coming back in 2019 and still uh, making a ruckus especially towards the end of the season once he seemed to be getting healthier so really I think the only, we've had some pass blocking concerns. I remember Jamal Adams punked him and took the ball straight from uh, Daniel Jones one time. So he's, I'm not saying he's the best, you know, pass blocking back in the league, but I think the only true issue people have with Saquon is 
some of these instances, you know, like the 13 carry one yard game against the Jets. We had that Steelers game uh, from week one last year. There are times where we see him just really have quite a few carries in a row where he goes nowhere. It kind of was a problem at, uh, in college as well. But like, what are we doing here? Because, you know, for someone like David Montgomery, Mike Davis, we say they don't have the home run speed. And for someone like Saquon, we say, well, he has the home run speed, but he can't, you know, he can't hit singles. He can't keep getting you three or four yards. Like, find me a running back in the NFL that just all he does is rip off, you know, between five and 50 yard gains. They don't exist. Like, they were always going to have some sort of a give between trying to get those big plays and just picking up consistent yardage. And I just don't think his split has been as severe as a lot of people make it out to be. We have a out of PFF called stuff rate. Basically, it's just your carries that went for negative or zero yards divided by your total rush attempts. He's at 9.2% in 2018-2019. Among 75 qualified backs, it's 40th. It's basically average in terms of the amount of times he's being stuffed at or behind the line of scrimmage, and he just so happens to have more big playability than just about anyone. So I really don't think there is a big issue in any part of Saquon's game, and the larger issue is just the offense he's been with, because ever since he got into the league, he's really been working with his back against the wall. I mean, this offensive line since 2018 they've ranked 16th 22nd most recently 23rd ranked unit and run blocking grade as a whole over those three years they've been a bottom five offensive line and our pff offensive line rankings which you can find on pff.com just came out last week they ranked dead last going into 2021 i mean a lot of it is just resource allocation like this is why he probably shouldn't have used a number two overall pick on saquon because in 2018 they had the 31st most dollars devoted to the offensive line 2019 25th 2020 got up there a little bit to 15th but in 2021 they're right back down there to 22nd so it reminds me of you know the Russell Wilson situation in Seattle where the offensive line has been bad and the front office just hasn't devoted resources to it to try to make them better. So, hey, you know, they have some young guys. Maybe they step up. Uh, you know, I believe, I believe Nate Soldier last year was an opt-out. He's going to be back there trying to play right tackle. Maybe they turn it around, just realize everybody, like a lot of things going the right way for this offensive line is probably going to produce at best like an, a league average unit. Like that's kind of what we're hoping for here. It's pretty hard to go from 32 to top 10. Giants fans should just be hoping from 32 to 20. I just... Really? Like Jason Garrett, that's going to be the guy that we uh, want to trust kind of making this happen. You know, they got Kenny Galladay, Kadarius Tony. Those are new elements of the offense in terms of contested catch and field stretching ability, you know, with Tony's speed and kind of what he can maybe bring horizontally as well. I'm not hating on these guys. Daniel Jones at least flashed in 2019. He had more 30 fantasy point uh, games than anyone other than Lamar Jackson. Problem is, where'd that go last year? Dak Prescott in four and a half games scored more total touchdowns than Daniel Jones did in 14. Like, it's... It's such a bad offense, like truly. And Giants fans, you know, I know, I know all of you are a sensitive bunch. I'm not trying to just rub your, you know, nose on a team that hasn't been very good over the past few years. I'm just not so sure we're going to see a big return to form from the group as a whole, primarily because I don't trust this offensive line. I don't trust Jason Garrett to get this done. I mean, I use that freaking train picture of him every week on social media. I just think it epitomizes what we're seeing. This is the reigning 31st ranked scoring offense, and I'm not so sure the change Changes are going to be enough for them to make a noticeable boost. With all that said, we're chasing volume in fantasy land. We always say it on this podcast, chase volume, not talent. And Saquon, he has, you know, other than McCaffrey and Dalvin Cook, who I think if everything goes right, and, you know, we could even throw Derrick Henry in there as well, but without the receptions, those are like our only guys that can push for 400 touches, but Saquon's right there in that 350 to 375 range, so he really is a top five volume back, and, you know, one another stat I love throwing out on here a lot, I mean, 2020, the PFF's top five offensive line run blocking grades, they produced four top 24 PPR backs. The bottom five offensive lines in PFF's run blocking grade also produce four top 24 PPR backs. So whether it's our ability to properly grade offensive lines, whether it's our ability to distinguish who's going to be good at the beginning of the year versus bad of the year, like volume can just overcome any sort of bad situation. And yeah, in that bad group, like we had guys like Austin Eckler and Miles Gaskin who were overcoming uh, you know, a lot of their issues 
in the past game in fantasy football, when we're playing four point per reception formats. Yeah, you that's the easiest way to overcome a bad offensive line is to catch the ball. Saquon caught 91 passes in 2018. Different offense, different quarterback. I get it, but hell, he caught you know 52 and 13 injury riddle games in 2019. So we really have a guy that it wouldn't be that shocking if he finishes uh, you know among the top four RBs in total receptions. I wouldn't put him ahead of McCaffrey, Eckler, probably not even Kamara. But just realize, people, Saquon is a special receiver in his own right as well. Now let's get to kind of the big question with them: What are we doing about this injury? A lot of people seem to be putting a lot of stock into ESPN's Jordan Renan's report about Saquon. And I'm confused because I saw the headline, which, hey, have you guys ever heard this? Like sometimes the headline or the ensuing kind of news blurbs are a little bit more more uh, clickbait than the actual point that was going on. But looking through the article, like Jim Mora has been saying throughout the offseason that Barkley is making good progress. Uh, I'm sorry, John Mora, excuse me. Uh, John Center John Mora said earlier this offseason, we fully expect him to be as good as new. Barkley is making good progress. He has not had any significant setbacks. And the one quote that is seemingly scaring everyone off, it's not like from a doctor. It's not from the Giants. It's from Jordan's own speculation. I understand he is tuned in with the Giants, and you would hope that he's going to you know, be writing stuff that he thinks is going to happen. But like, here is the paragraph that I think is causing everyone to think Saquon is not going to be playing like his full allotment of snaps early in the year. The idea is to bring Barkley along slowly to make sure he's healthy for the duration of the 17-game season and hopefully a postseason. So what if he is not on the field taking his usual 85% of snaps week one against the Denver Broncos? Concentrating on the first few games would be short-sighted. Like... Yeah, it makes sense. I agree with that. I think we would all agree with that. But nothing in there is from the Giants like specifically saying that they're going to limit him come week one. Should Saquon play a single snap in the preseason? Probably not. He's at OTAs, rehabbing, doing his thing. And I just don't think, I just think we're all taking a really big assumption, I should say, that he's not going to be out there. Because the last time we saw Saquon get hurt, he beat his timeline by, he only he was only out three weeks, four to eight timeline uh, expected. And he came right back to an 86% snap and 21 touches right after. On a 2-4 and four Giants team, they said, we don't care, you're our guy. That was under a different coaching staff. I get it. It's a different injury. You know, a surgically reconstructed knee is different than a high ankle sprain. I understand those things. But basically, I want to listen to doctors. And I am not a doctor. So I listen to Evan Porras, Fantasy Point's main doctor. And I think he's one of the best in the business at what he does. He was on the podcast last year. We'll have him on again this year, a little bit closer to the season. But per Dr. Evan Seven pores. Barkley checks each of his top three predictive variables for success after an ACL tear. Number one, having high draft capital. This is just like a talent thing. Basically, guys that he's seen that are drafted higher are tend to be the freakier athletes, and these guys tend to recover from these sorts of injuries faster. Hence why Barkley recovered from the high ankle sprain in three weeks instead of eight. Number two, age number 24. If you're 24 or younger, you have a better uh, historical success rate. And number three, going through a relatively non-complex injury. And that one part, you know, my was tweeting about this struck a nerve of some because Saquon did suffer some MCL damage and stuff in addition to the ACL. But again, I don't know what a complex injury is. I'm sure you probably don't either listening to this. Edwin does. And per Edwin, he said this is min to moderate complexity. The terrible triad, unhappy triad is extremely common. If you Google it, rarely is it isolated ACL. They were able to avoid a menisectomy, which is huge. Even if he sees 6% of his snaps weeks one through three, which I'm still not convinced happens because Edwin's with me. He thinks he gets an immediate 80% snap roll. Edwin is not panicking. So that's my thing here. Like, I want to try to listen to the smartest person about injuries, and I don't think ESPN's Jordan Renan is that person in this place. So if we hear, hey, I'm, I'm open to new news, I we will listen to it. And if you know the Giants make it very clear that Devontae Booker is going to be out there as well, and they're splitting it up, and Jason Garrett tells us specifically that Saquon is not going to be playing his usual role to start, okay, we'll adjust. But for right now, I'm going with the freaky athlete who suffered a week two injury and has had more than enough time to get back to it based on what we've seen historically from these sorts of injuries. So takes us to our PFF Lily stat people. In NFL history, PPR points per game at the running back position, only Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, and Jim Brown have averaged more PPR points per game than Saquon Barkley. Truly what he's done early on in his career has been nothing short of remarkable, and that is why he is my PPR RB3, only behind McCaffrey and Dalvin Cook at the moment. Look, I think both of them are in better schemed offenses, and I just think their touch ceilings are even a little bit higher than Saquon, uh, particularly when we 
we do need to consider, even though I am fading the idea he is limited early in the year, it is a more valid concern than these other guys. So for that, he is my RB3. I would take him ahead of Derrick Henry because of the potential for a lot more receiving workload. I take him ahead of Alvin Kamara because he's going to get the rushing workload. Like Alvin Kamara, he's never had 200 rush attempts, right? I'm pretty freaking sure that's a fact. And, you know, when we're talking about a difference of like 100 rush attempts, that does become a problem. Yeah, he's never had over uh, 200 of those. So, yeah, Zeke, I think, is the only guy other than McCaffrey and Dalvin who can kind of compete with Saquon just from a pure volume standpoint. But this is where, when it does come to a tiebreaker scenario, I am going to take the guy that I consider to be the far better talent at this point in his career. People, if health was assumed and given for everyone and the aliens invaded our planet to face us off, Space Jam type tournament to save the human race, I would want Saquon Barkley as our RB1. With all due respect to Nick Chubb, Alvin Kamara, Derrick Henry, all those guys, I do think when he is right, Saquon Barkley is the best running back alive. Hey, people, if you've enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to check out PFS Podcast Network, which covers everything NFL, college, and fantasy football. You can recap the NFL draft with Mike Renner and Austin Gale's 2 for 1 Drafts podcast, or get all the 2021 betting content you need with the PFF forecast. I invite you to check out our 2021 Best Ball Draft Kit as well. Myself, Andrew Erickson, Kevin Cole, Nathan Yonke, all sorts of good fantasy football information in there. And hey, you got to apply it once you know it. So if you like fantasy football, if you like playing fantasy for money, you need to check out Underdog Fantasy. Underdog's got everything, including season long and playoff best ball. Best ball is a season long game where you draft a team like you normally do. But that's it. There's no in season roster management. Underdog automatically selects your best performers each week, saving you loads of time. So go to Underdog Fantasy and deposit the $10 using promo code PFF and get a free PFF Edge annual description. That's promo code PFF draft now at Underdog Fantasy. That's good to do, everybody. Thank you as always for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. New fantasy files every single day and i got articles going up on pff.com as well one final note absolutely not related to anything but you know i do have thoughts on non-football things from time to time i don't want to jam up an intro and waste all you guys' time that just want to hear fantasy stuff but i was at this uh, conference the uh fsga in dallas a big fantasy gaming type thing and i get to my hotel room and i make coffee in the morning you know it's fine good enough and i go back why do we insist on having the same amount of decaf as regular coffee i i'm not saying it's a awful like okay some people can't have caffeine they, and they still want coffee so they have decaf that's fine but to pretend like it's 50 50 that's absolutely insane to me like you look at the regular coffee crowd and it's got to be 80 20 like and that's being generous 90 10 regular versus decaf but then you go to a hotel and they give you one decaf and one regular i hate it and if you're any if any hotel managers out there make the default regular make the exception decaf it's killing me it has for years and i had to get that off my chest so with that all that said, thank you as always for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Until next time, take care, everybody.